Andy Warhol, famously quoted as saying, In the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Except he probably never said that. It first appeared as a quote in a 1968 brochure advertising a show of his in Stockholm, Sweden, where it was reportedly completely made up by the curator, as he thought it sounded like something Andy would say. And apparently he was right, as everyone now thinks he said it originally. Warhol confirmed this story was true in 1980, although he also denied it in 1979, and a couple of other people lay claim to ownership of the quote too, which all makes perfect sense. As when it comes to Andy Warhol, nothing is what it appears, and nothing makes any freaking sense. This is Campbell's Soup Cans, a series of 32 almost identical paintings of, well, soup cans, duh. Created between 1961 and 1962 by Andrei Warhol Jr., better known as Andy Warhol. Each painting shows one of the 32 flavours available at the time. These made up Andy's very first solo exhibition in 1962 in LA, and they're still instantly recognisable today. Not too bad for first crack, I suppose. Rather than being hung on walls as you'd expect, the paintings were presented on shelves, lending an uncanny supermarket-like vibe to the gallery which some people credit as a watershed moment in thinking outside the box <laughs> and revolutionising how art was presented. As Andy profoundly said afterwards, can sit on shelves. Deep. The show garnered what could best be described as mixed reviews at the time, with a rather snarky cartoon printed in the LA Times, though everyone knows making cartoons mocking people is the lowest form of humour, and a nearby rival gallery started selling actual cans of soup to save people the effort of going to Warhol's show five of the paintings were purchased. Briefly. Irving Blum, one of the gallery's owners, decided that he wanted the whole set for himself, and he bought back all the sold paintings. He then paid Andy $1,000 for the rest, which proved to be a pretty good investment, as he ended up selling the set in 1996 for a cool $15 million. Artists have got inspiration from many sources over the years. Some artists made their name by painting biblical scenes, some for epic seascapes. Andy Warhol became famous for painting canned goods. Now, soup cans may seem like a strange muse for an artist to be inspired to paint. When asked why he had chosen such a mundane, shallow, commercial subject, Warhol's stock explanation was it was what he'd had for lunch every day for the previous 20 years, which implies a sense of comfort, nostalgia, a deep inner connection to home, and a mother he was inseparable from for much of his life. But, a few months before diving into his soup phase, Andy had been drawing cartoon characters. Upon seeing Roy Lichtenstein's exhibit of similar work, he said screw that, and was on the lookout for a new direction. Enter Muriel Latow. But Andy paid $50 after she'd given him the idea of soup cans, so it's both far more meaningful and personal, and yet even more capitalist and soulless than it seems at first glance. The Andy Warhol story is full of contradictions just like this. Constantly at the centre of attention, but notoriously shy. Always in the public eye, but often reluctant to be in the public ear and actually speak. He was regularly seen in amongst the drugs and debauchery of Studio 54 at night, but at confession and mass every day. Andy's inherent talent was that he had his finger on the pulse of what was marketable and attention-grabbing, but at the peak of his fame in the mid-60s, he chose to start making black-and-white silent movies when the world was clamouring for Technicolor. <laughs> Now, just to be safe, I feel I should warn you there are spoilers ahead. Like Empire, an eight hour long static shot of the Empire State Building just existing. Or Sleep, a five hour compilation of footage of his boyfriend sleeping. At a time where Andy Warhol was bigger than Jesus, these were not exactly Hollywood blockbusters. Everything you read about Andy Warhol is 50% truth, 50% spin, 16% contradiction, 9% legend, and 3% polyester. There's a great story about how Warhol stayed so thin. I mean, it was mainly speed, but there was other stuff too, you know. Apparently, whenever Andy found himself eating in an expensive restaurant, he would intentionally order food he hated so as not to be tempted to eat, play with it while the others dined, and then get a doggy bag and leave it on the corner for a homeless person to find and enjoy. Although, if there's one thing I've learned so far, it's not to believe anything about Warhol, so what probably actually happened is he then hunted the tramp for sport and feasts on his flesh. So I literally don't know what to think at this point. In 2008, Andy Warhol became only the fifth artist in the world to have a painting sell for over $100 million. And while the first thing most people think of when you mention Warhol 
is these bright, colourful, screen-printed works. The majority of these were mass-produced, with sometimes hundreds of near-identical works out there which harms their value to collectors. So the first Warhol to break the 100 milli mark was this, Eight Elvises, which is absolutely unique. Ish. I mean, how different the Eight Elvises is to all the Triple Elvises and Double Elvises out there, I'm not sure. Obviously it's technically speaking one of a kind, as this is the only one with eight, but he's not exactly reinventing the wheel here, is he? Surely it'd be cheaper to buy a couple of double elvises and a shed load of whiskey so you're just constantly seeing double. Little life pro tip for you there, kids, if you're ever looking to save a few million on a Warhol. But that was surpassed as the most expensive Warhol work in 2013 by Silver Car Crash Double Disaster. Again, quite a departure from the stereotypical Warhol look, though he personally is arguably more proud of the Death and Disaster series this is from, and of all the Marilyns and the soup cans. Now, the main reason I mention these works is I think it's a massive shame that no one actually knows who currently owns either of them, or where they are, and no one's actually seen either of them for decades. Obviously the people who actually own them know, I'm not suggesting some bloke is going to wake up and find 100 million quids of a Warhol under his bed and wonder how it got there, but it's not publicly available information. And maybe they are taking pride of place over some Bond villain's mantelpiece somewhere in the world. It's far more likely they're being kept in a temperature controlled barbed wire fenced warehouse somewhere, accumulating value and a good way of avoiding tax. It's a sad indictment of the art world all round and unfortunately an ever growing phenomenon as more and more great art is being hoarded in warehouses like this, away from the public eye. But that's a discussion for a whole other video. It does occur to me though, if someone were to theoretically break into one of these warehouses storing these wonderful works and liberate them, would it be the worst thing in the world? Just saying. Totally not just saying that at all, for legal reasons our review does not condone or promote theft or crime even when it's totally justified. Not that this would be justified of course. According to Andy Warhol in a quote that I'm 99% sure he actually said, art is anything you can get away with. I think that says a lot about the era he was creating in and his vision for the future of art. There have been different movements and styles through the history of European art, but for several hundred years it had predominantly consisted of realistic paintings and sculptures of broadly the same kinds of people and things. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of people out there who disagree with that statement. Deal with it. But these days, all bets are off. An installation that looks like a pub? I'll drink to that. 150 tonnes of sunflower seeds? Wee oui, wee. Oui. A tenth of a load of names gaffer tape to the inside? Jump in. A naked bald chick with a huge fork on the back of a giant cock standing on one leg? Um, yeah, sure, I guess, if that's the kind of thing. So whether you love or hate Andy Warhol's art, I think most people would have to agree that he was someone who really understood the seismic shift art was going through in the 20th century, and he forever changed the way art was produced and perceived. And again, he also said making money was the best kind of art, and owning land without ruining it was the most beautiful form of art. So maybe it was just full of crap, I don't know. Thanks as always for watching, if you enjoyed it please like and subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. If there's someone you think might enjoy it, send it to them and share it around. Thanks for watching, see you next time.